Hi, Rob D here. Before we get started, a quick correction. We said last week that we would be speaking to Robert Kiyosaki this week. In fact, it's going to be next week. But we promise you, it's a great conversation that's going to be worth waiting for. Now, let's get on with this week's episode. Hey, Rob B here with Rob D. You know what's bonkers? It's that we're nearly 400 episodes into the podcast. No, not that we're 400 episodes in. It's that we're 400 episodes in nearly. And yet, we've not talked about exit strategies. Well, finally, we're going to put that right. We've taught you how to start, we've taught you how to build, and this week, we're going to teach you how to exit. Welcome to The Property Podcast, where every Thursday, property investors come to be informed and inspired. But you know what? However informed and inspired you are, there might be a point where you want to take it easy a bit. Maybe you want to retire. Maybe you want to trim your portfolio down. Maybe you just want to get rid of the lot and go lie on a beach somewhere. Well, whatever you want to do, there is an exit strategy for you. And we're going to be running through all of those today. So keep listening. So in this week's news story, the headline reads, Markets predicting negative base rates as Bank of England keeps options open. So in the last couple of weeks, the Bank of England have voted unanimously, nine votes to zero, that they will keep interest rates at an historic low of 0.1%. 0.1%, still getting used to that, crazy. What could be more crazy is that we could even go somehow lower. Now, Rob, the Bank of England haven't said we're going into negative interest rates, but the markets think we will. Yeah, if you look at how things are priced, it seems like the market does expect base rates to go negative at some point in the next year even though at the moment they're not planning to do it. And as you just said, they voted unanimously not to do it right now. And also the economic data is looking better than expected or less bad than expected is probably a better way of putting it. So will the markets be right? Will we see negative interest rates? It's kind of crazy to think about. I don't think it's actually as big a deal as it first seems because we've already got negative real interest rates and going nominally negative wouldn't really make as much of a difference as you think it would. But still, it's never happened before, so it would be quite something to live through. But even if they don't end up doing it, the article suggests that they have got other options open to them if they'd rather avoid that. One of which, Rob, is QE. We've already seen a lot of it this year and we could be seeing more. Yet QE, quantitative easing, or the creation of money, the Bank of England have not been afraid to do that recently. They've done it in record amounts. It's absolutely crazy. So that's probably the easier option, the one that will ruffle the least feathers. As you said, Rob, going into negative interest rates and what it does versus the headlines it will create, I think is is that trade-off. I think negative interest rates would create such a buzz in the UK media and get so much attention from the general public and possibly scare a few people as well that maybe the easier option is to push on with QE a little bit longer and to see how that plays out before they pull the trigger on going into negative interest rates. Who knows? Well, maybe the Bank of England. But at the moment, they haven't done anything. But we'll keep a watch on it and, of course, keep you updated. And so we come to the end. No, not of the property podcast. We're sticking around for a while yet, but we come to the end of your investing life. Today, we are looking to the future. Maybe for you, the distant future, or maybe not quite so distant, but we're looking at exit strategies. What are we doing all this for? Everything that we talk about every week when we're worrying about the economy and whether the rent's going to get paid and everything else that we talk about on this podcast, what does it all lead up to? As a result of slogging away at this property lark for years and years, what options do you have when you get to the end? Well, that is what we're going to talk about today. Now, the portfolio that you have today isn't necessarily the one that you'll have when you get to this end point, especially if it's quite distant for you. That portfolio might be bigger than it is today. Hopefully it will be. And it might be made up of different properties. You might have a different amount of debt. How your portfolio changes throughout your investing life is a really interesting topic in itself. And it's one that we're going to tackle in a different episode soon. A topic we've changed our mind about quite a bit as well. So listen out for that one. But today we're talking about what you could call the end of your active investing life. When you start thinking less about how to accumulate more and your priority becomes how can your portfolio or the assets that you've built up sustain you through the rest of your life while you don't work and you do whatever you want to do. So Rob, let's get into this. Broadly, there are three options that we're going to talk about. There's lots of detail in each that we'll go into. But the first option is keep a portfolio forever. The second option is reduce your portfolio and clear the debt. 
And the third option is just sell everything. So those are your options in very broad terms, but there's lots of detail to get into on each of those. So let's do it. Yeah. So your first option, keep a portfolio forever. Well, you could just carry on, change absolutely nothing. And you can do that. And a lot of people struggle with this as a concept because they feel like they must do something with their portfolio at some point. But if your portfolio is providing you an income and you're quite happy with that income and potentially you may one day want to pass your portfolio on to future generations, then you can just carry on. And that income can be your retirement income. Now, I think the reason why a lot of people struggle with this as a concept is mortgages. And that's because people feel like they must pay off the mortgage. That must be the deal, right? At some point, I've got to pay this mortgage off. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. Because later in life, you can still continue to get buy-to-let mortgages. At 65, it doesn't stop, or 70. There are mortgage products available to way later in life. And lenders are often quite comfortable with that because the chances are the amount of leverage you have against your portfolio, the amount of debt, has decreased over time because your portfolio has gone up in value, but you've not necessarily been refinancing as aggressively as you normally would, if at all, towards the end of this investment cycle. So I think that's the first thing we need to make clear and the first sort of myth around exit strategies we need to kind of bust is that you can, if you want to, just carry on exactly as you were with the exact same portfolio as before and that is okay but rob in practicality you wouldn't do that because there are things you probably want to consider that will improve this as an option yeah i think it's a really interesting idea the fact that there doesn't have to be this event you could just do nothing and let things carry on and you've been building up this portfolio and this income on the side and then one day you just stop working but your portfolio keeps on going and going But while you can definitely keep a portfolio running forever with debt if you want to, you're probably not going to want to own exactly the same portfolio in retirement as you do before because your objectives will have changed. So when you're in the wealth accumulation phase of your life, you're probably going to be focused on capital growth to a fairly large extent. You'll be trying to build up your asset base and there are certain types of property that you'll target to help you do that. Then when you get to retirement, you're probably not going to be as bothered about capital growth. You're going to be more focused on having an income, a steady income coming in that's going to pay for your lifestyle during retirement. So what you might actually end up doing is owning quite a different portfolio. So you'll sell certain properties. Maybe you'll sell the ones that were geared more towards growth and are not paying you much of an income. Maybe you'll sell the ones that are a bit of a pain to manage. And in their place, you'll buy properties that are more income focused, that have easier management. Maybe you'll rationalise your portfolio geographically. So if you've got properties spread all over the place, you might favour having them all in one location so they're easier to look after. There are lots of different tweaks that you might make. And it would make sense to do that because, like I said, your priorities will have changed. So within this option of keeping a portfolio forever, you've actually got two distinct sub options. One is just carry on. Nothing happens. There is no exit. Nobody watching would ever notice it had happened. And the other option is you keep the portfolio, but it's a slightly different portfolio. The final point on this option is that you could be thinking, yeah, this sounds good. But what about a bit of fun, a bit of excitement? I've built this portfolio up for years and years and years. Can I access some of the wealth of the portfolio? Well, possibly you can. What you could do is release equity from one of your properties and take that as a lump sum. Of course, your mortgage costs will go up slightly as well. But say you wanted to take 50000 out, 100000 out, depending on the size of your portfolio, you can do. Now, if you own that property or, or those properties in your own name, then you won't pay any tax on that because it's a debt. So for some, this might be quite appealing. If you invest through a limited company, The debt itself isn't taxable, but the equity release remains in the company. So if you then take it out, you will have to pay some tax on that. But the price of that tax may be worth paying for you. So you ultimately still own and keep that portfolio, but you've released a bit of equity from it to enjoy it a bit. You continue to get your income, which is reduced marginally by the new mortgage costs, but you also have that lump sum. And for some people, that'll be the best of both worlds. So just something else to bear in mind as well when you consider this strategy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you never get a lump sum. You can keep your portfolio forever and access a lump sum as well. So that's option one, keeping a portfolio forever. Option two is sell some of your portfolio and pay off the debt and have your portfolio debt free. 
Yeah, and this is something that's going to be appealing to a lot of people. Because like Rob said, you can have mortgages till much, much later in life. But a lot of people just don't want to. They want to take worrying about interest rates and things like that off the table completely. They just want to know that they own their portfolio free and clear. I think a lot of the time those worries are more imagined than real. But nevertheless, it's an emotional thing. And it's important because if you're going into a later stage of your life and you want to relax and have fun and do the things that you want to do, it's stupid to have a worry holding you back and playing on your mind when it doesn't have to. So what you can do is sell some of your portfolio to pay off the debt on the rest. Now, if the property cycle has been helping you out and you've not been refinancing aggressively, then the loan to value on your portfolio by the time you get to this point should be lower than it is now. So it might be the case that you only need to sell one or two properties to clear the debt on everything else. And this is where having a portfolio is so powerful. If you've only got one property, then you are kind of stuck in this binary keep it or sell it mode. But if you've got a portfolio of multiple properties, then we've already seen the changes that you can make to the composition of that. But you could also just sell a couple to free up the rest. And Rob, of course, not every purchase is a great one. So this is a nice opportunity to selectively offload as well. Yeah, of course. If you are going to sell, then why not sell the ones that are a bit of a pain in the bum? Not all properties are created equal. Some ended up being absolute corkers and you're so glad you invested in them. And some, well let's face it, end up more work than you'd anticipated. And for some reason, continue to operate that way. So if you build a sizable portfolio, at some point, you're going to have properties like that in your portfolio. So if you are going to sell them, why on earth would you sell the ones that are great and keep the ones that are a pain in the bum? You want to get rid of the ones that are a challenge. So do that. Make sure you're selective in the properties that you do sell. But remember, with all of this, timing is important. You know, we do have property cycles, so don't be completely rigid on the date you sell. So don't go, right, 60, come rain or shine, I'm selling my portfolio. Because if the market's just crashed, then that's not necessarily the best time to be repositioning your portfolio. So if you follow the 18-year property cycle and you anticipate a crash is coming, then if it makes more sense to do it at 58 or 59, then do it. Don't be so rigid. But also, if it means that you've got to wait to 62, 63, because your portfolio will be in a better place then, because you're going to have a good few years of growth because of where the cycle is right now, then hold. You're still making an income, remember? So don't be so rigid. Keep the cycle in mind, of course. Remember, you've got mortgage products as well, which may be fixed to certain points and dates. You have to keep that in mind as well. But while this may sound like it was a bit too this, there actually isn't. It's actually quite a simplistic strategy. And as Rob said, it's one that's going to appeal to a lot of people because of the emotion that people have around debt. They shouldn't have it, but most people do. So this is a strategy that will be very appealing. Yeah, it's a nice option because you have removed mortgages as a concern. You don't have to think about interest rates anymore. You don't even necessarily have to think about capital values anymore. You don't have to think about anything except the rent that's coming in. And if you've done a bit of that work that we talked about earlier with repositioning your portfolio, so you're getting those that are easier to manage, that do pay you a solid income, then you're in a good place. Because property values go up and down. We talk about the property cycle, which is a way of trying to anticipate what they're going to do, but they can move a lot and they can move quickly. But rents are very, very steady. Even in recessions, even in market crashes, rents tend to hold up. They can even improve because you've got people who were owner occupiers now moving into the rental sector. And another benefit of living off your rents is that they tend to rise in line with inflation. So you've got an inflation linked income stream to see you through the rest of your life. Now, all that still applies if you are carrying debt on your portfolio. But if the debt is the bit that worries you, then you can get rid of that, keep all those other benefits and have a glorious retirement. But Rob, perhaps neither of these options are going to be right, despite the benefits I've just talked about. And in fact, you'll want to sell everything. And you know what? You can do. You can sell everything and realise all the rewards from the hard work that you've put in through over the years. So what do you do with that lump sum? Well, you could go wild if you want (laughs) and blow it on... Fast cars and fancy yachts, maybe give some of it away, or probably maybe enjoy it a little bit. But for a lot of people, they may want to enjoy a little bit of it, but most will then put it into another investment, and that other investment being much more passive. So if the thought of just owning property at all into retirement doesn't appeal, then this is the way to go. You can still get a return by putting all that cash into a more passive investment. And yes, you might not get the capital growth by doing that, 
And yes, you can't take advantage of things like leverage, entire market cycles, and all the fun things that property allows you to do. But that's okay. You've done all that. And now you just want an easy life. And that's absolutely fine. And a lot of people will do this. It's okay to let go of property at some point in your life. For some people, they'll be shuddering at the thought. But for others, they'll feel quite relieved to hear us say that. You can do it. And it's as simple as it sounds. You will just sell your properties. Now, where it becomes a little bit more complex, of course, is tax. So in theory, you don't flick a switch and all your portfolio is liquidated in one day. Because for most people, they will want to at least take tax into consideration. I think before we talk about tax, though, it's worth saying, do not let tax completely dictate to you your actions. If selling the portfolio allows you to live the life you want to live, achieve the things you want to achieve, and you've got to pay for it a little bit, well, that's okay. Don't hold back. If paying a bit of tax means you can retire a few years early or do all the fun things that you've wanted to do all your life, then just do it. Pay that little bit more. But Rob, while that is true, of course, you want to at least be aware of the tax implications and do your best to minimise it if you can and if it's right to. Yeah, there are some things that you can do and it depends if you own the property as a company or as an individual. So if you're a company, then companies don't get personal allowances. They'll just end up paying corporation tax on the whole lot. So there'll be a tax hit there. But then you can time the payouts to yourself from that company over whatever time scale you like. So if you don't need it all at once and you want to keep your income low, so you stay in the basic band, then you can just pay yourself out over years, take advantage of any allowances you've got and keep your tax bill under control that way. If you own the property as an individual, then you do get a tax-free allowance each year. So you'll probably want to gradually sell your portfolio in different tax years to maximise the use of that allowance. But realistically, if you have been building a portfolio for possibly decades, then you will have a fairly junky capital gains tax bill. But like you said, Rob, that should not dictate what you do. It's something you need to think about. But the number of people you see who say things like, oh, I can't sell it because I'll have to pay capital gains tax. That's just insane to me because... It's not like you have to find it out of your pocket. You're paying over a portion of a gain and the rest of it, the vast majority of it, you get to put in your pocket. So of course, minimise it. But if that's what you want to do, then just do it. So there we have it. After nearly 400 episodes, we finally talk about how to exit your portfolio. And we're going to expand on this episode in the coming weeks where we'll talk about different stages of your ownership and the things you may want to do. So make sure you listen out for that one. So it's time for our success story now, and you can get these in however you want. You can drop us a message on the socials, you can send us an email, or like Jess, you can leave us a review on iTunes. And Jess has left this lovely five-star review. I've done it. I've gone back and listened to every single episode over the space of a year and taken action. I came across the Property Podcast last August and loved it and decided to go right back to the beginning and listen through which seemed like a big undertaking at the time. The two Robs and all of their guests have since inspired me to take some big actions. I've winded my network presence in person and online, volunteered, done some casual work with a property company, set up two property-related businesses, sourcing and home staging, and positively developed my mindset, as well as goal setting. I'm just about to be in my first JV to add to the buy-to-let that kicked this all off. Today, I've just listened to the final episode of all seven years worth to bring me bang up to date, and I'm pretty pleased with what I've achieved this year. Rob and Rob, thank you for the inspiration. Look forward to what the next year brings. Jess, that's quite a year, except listening to all the episodes in one year, seven years worth. Seems a bit bonkers, but we don't care because the action that it seems that it's inspired you to take by going through that is brilliant. Well done. It's been quite a year, and that truly is a success story. So congratulations, Jess. Do keep us in the loop of what happens for you in the future. But what an incredible start. Time now for Hub Extra, where we give you that little bit more, whether it's a tool, a resource, or just something to think about. And we back it up with the Hub Extra email, which will hit your inbox every Friday morning without fail if you are a Property Hub member, which you should be. Go to propertyhub.net and sort it out if you're not. Now, if, like Jess, you have listened to all 390 episodes of the Property Podcast, you will, on a few of those weeks, have heard us talking about various tools that we use to stay productive, especially when it comes to using music. Because both of us, when we're working from home, find that the right music can really help us to stay in the zone and get more done and avoid being distracted. And I recently found a resource called Flow State. We'll link to it in the show notes. But what it is, is a daily email 
every day it'll send you a link to a new artist where they've handpicked it as music that is good for concentration. And the reason I like it is there's loads of variety. Some of it's electronic, some of it is more piano music, there's all sorts. But they clearly do a really good job of picking it because I find that all of it, whatever it is, really is great for concentration. And having something new arriving daily gives some really nice variety. So if that sounds interesting to you, you'll find the link to Flow State in today's show notes. So that's us done for this week. Thank you for listening. But if you want more, don't worry, we're back with Ask Rob and Rob on Tuesday and the Property Podcast same time next week, where we'll be giving you a market update, and there is loads going on right now. But if that is not enough, and that's quite a lot, then do get in touch via the socials, and you'll be able to find us at Property Hub UK, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all of it. We're there, so go check that out. Until we're back with you next time, take care, have fun, bye-bye. Bye-bye. 